conversation in store for you tonight. But let me first start by saying that this webinar is part of a larger effort dating back to last spring to deliver meaningful content to our alumni and friends where they are. We feature JCU faculty and fellow alumni covering topics ranging from the economy to racial equity, space exploration, and politics. Through these efforts, we've engaged thousands of alumni as far away as Europe and South America. Tonight is another great example, this time exploring faith and spirituality. I'm delighted to introduce to you our speakers. First, Father Cyril Pinchak of the Society of Jesus and from the class of 2006. Father Pinchak majored in English and minored in psychology at JCU. He was born and raised in Shaker Heights, and he joined the Jesuits in 2006. He studied philosophy, theology, and English at John Carroll before going on to teach and coach cross country, hockey, and track at the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and Academy. He was ordained a priest in 2017 and has spent the last three years in Rome, Italy, where he recently completed a licensure license in theology. <laughs> He's gonna laugh because I mispronounced that. In theology, studying Eastern Catholic patristic theology at the Pontifical Oriental Institute. He currently teaches theology at St. Ignatius High School right here in Cleveland. I should also note, uh, Father Pinchak was inducted into the JC Athletic Hall of Fame in 2018, and I was honored to be a part of that same class of inductees. And he was actually in Rome at the time and gave his speech in video format, probably on the Zoom platform. Uh, Father Pinchak, welcome. Uh, Laura Kistart uh, graduated from John Carroll University in 2013. And while at John Carroll, Laura studied political science and was active with campus ministry. Laura recently graduated from Yale Divinity School with her master's in divinity and will be ordained in the United Church of Christ this fall. She is associate pastor at First Congregation Church of Southington in Connecticut. Laura enjoys helping others deepen their spiritual lives by sharing contemplative prayer practices inspired by her introduction to Ignatian spirituality while at John Carroll. Before I turn things over to Cyril and Laura, uh, again, I want to remind everyone, please put your uh, Zoom uh, function on mute and leave that on mute throughout. And if you have any questions along the way, you can enter those in the chat box, and we will make sure we moderate those questions and pose those to our presenters tonight. With that, I will turn things over, I believe, to Associate Pastor Kistart. Thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you to Eric for the invitation. Um, it's really great to connect with John Carroll alumni um, all across the country. So um, the prompt that Eric gave us was the from the responsive psalm from the Mass of the Holy Spirit um, earlier today. And, you know, again, thanks to the wonders of technology, I was able to uh, watch part of that Mass um, on YouTube. And um, so that response to the psalm was, in every age, O Lord, you have been our refuge. And that's from Psalm 90. Um, so that's, you know, the, the prompt that I was thinking about in connection to finding God in all things. And there's just, there's so much really in just those brief lines. In every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. And the first thing I wanted to share was just thinking back to my own time at John Carroll. And, you know, that, that first part of the, the psalm saying, in every age, and just finding assurance in that because, this is saying, you know, that as followers of Jesus in every age, we can find our refuge in God. Um, so, you know, no matter what our John Carroll experience was, if there were if there were struggles that we faced, we hopefully could find our refuge in God through through our experience there. And I know that was the case for me, um, just my four years there. Each year looked really different on campus. Um, and so in some ways, I found God in all things like through through my refuge, I was an RA, and so in the dorms that I was living in, I definitely found my refuge in those places, um, creating a safe living space there, and and then also finding refuge through community. That was, you know, obviously a really important part of the John Carroll experience was building community and those lifelong friendships and. Um, really the, the best way that I built community was especially through, um, through campus ministry and on retreats. And, um, those could be retreats that were just, you know, a weekend or 
like especially Manresa, that was a really important part for of me for my faith journey and time at John Carroll. Um, or also just um, you know from longer retreats too. I I had the opportunity to go on the eight day silent retreat while I was at John Carroll and getting to find refuge in time with God, um, surrounded by a bunch of other college students who you know. Many people probably when they were thinking about college didn't ever really think like, oh, I'm going to go on an eight day silent retreat. Um, so so that was a really fun thing for me thinking back of like how I found refuge in God um, through various times at John Carroll. And and so, you know, the time that we find ourselves in now, finding our refuge in God and and. And finding God in all things, I think that um, you know, there's there's several places that I've found refuge in the midst of this pandemic, and um, you know that is primarily through prayer. But that prayer can come in things that you might not expect. Um, so for me, the one you know unexpected way that I've found refuge and found God has just been in the simple act of washing dishes. Um, to you know, have that be quiet time where I am intentionally washing dishes and seeing that as a way of refuge from just the busy life. That even though I might be finding refuge at home um, by you know staying at home and you know being safe in that way, um, I can still find you know more ways to encounter God in different ways um, through through washing dishes, through taking a walk around the block. Um, I think that we can find refuge. Um, just you know in our in our daily surroundings and um, and then one other way as well can be finding refuge just in in the people that we surround ourselves with and in this time we might not be surrounded by you know a lot of people physically but we can find refuge through continued relationship um, with you know with our John Carroll friends with our family and just again through the wonders of technology being able to connect with so many people and finding refuge in those relationships not only with God and through prayer but um, finding refuge through through those people that just nourish your spirit and and help you to remember that you know like that's like the psalm response begins in every age you know, that God God has been with us through challenging times before and will continue to get us through this time. So I pass my remarks over to Father Cyril. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, it's really been an honor to, to be here. Um, I'm really grateful to, to Eric and also to all the folks in the alumni um, who, have, who have helped make this possible. So I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity. As I thought about this idea of from the Psalms, in every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. What immediately came to mind for me is this idea that God's love is steadfast and it's faithful. That in every age we can trust in God's love. And, and the Hebrew term for that is hesed. That it's this ongoing, continuous love. That it, it's in our life and we cannot possibly avoid it or escape it. And I was struck by, by two things, um, the idea of memory and the idea of the, the Jesuit examine. So the examine is something that St. Ignatius encourages all people who do the spiritual exercises to do, to all people who are inspired by, the Ignatian, by Ignatian spirituality to do the examine. And it can be a bit challenging. We do it here at St. Ignatius uh, every day right before the, the final period of the day. Um, and we do kind of variations on it and, and try to encourage the students to reflect on their day. And there's two things worth noting. In the spiritual exercises, when Ignatius talks about the exam, and he says, I will ask for an account of my day. The fascinating thing about the exam is it's not so much that I say what's important to me in my day, but that God directs my attention and shows me what is it that's really important, Lord? What do you want me to see? And so in the exam, it's, it's an opportunity to ask God to point out what's actually most meaningful, most important in our life. Where is our energy going? Where are we, what are we worried about? What are we hopeful for? Where, where have we been consoled? Where have we been challenged? Where have we felt like we've sinned and let, let God down and let other people down? An image I like to, to use is that in the miracle of the loaves and fishes, Jesus takes the bread and the fish, and he breaks it, and he gives it to the disciples, and feeds 5,000 people. 
But no one really understood it or saw it to be a miracle until the disciples went back and, and gathered together the wicker baskets, 12 wicker baskets full of fragments. And I think sometimes that's what the examine is. It's, it's taking these pieces, these fragments of our day, and gathering them all together and going, wow, what just happened? This is incredible. God is so good. And recognizing the miracle that, that each day is and that God is working each and every day. And so when we, we begin to reflect on that, when we ask God to say, show me what you want me to see in my day. Here are my preoccupations and worries. These are the things that I think are really important. But what do you want me to see? What moment of grace, of peace, of beauty, of nature that I saw or a friend reaching out? And I think when we start to do the examine each and every day with that kind of intentionality and freedom, then what we discover is we discover that miracle, that steadfast, hesed, ongoing love of God. I just want to share a brief personal kind of anecdote. And I was reading a poem on, on uh, my eight-day silent retreat that we Jesuits have to do every year, and it's called The Filling Station by Elizabeth Bishop. And I don't want to ruin it for you, but you read through it, and there's this line at the end that just blew me away. All of a sudden, something just clunked into place, and my way of seeing the world had changed. And you'll have those experiences in your life where something just happens. You read something, someone says something to you, and it just changes the way you see reality. You see something more real, more true, in a, in a, in a profound way. And what it, the realization that I had, had afterwards, thinking about this, is that I want to be able to, to remember this moment and recall it, and be able to, years and years later, remember this experience of just reading this poem and going, like, wow, what an insight. Not, not because I can ever repeat that experience, not because I'll go back to being that ignorant or whatever that I was before and have that moment of insight, but I want to remember it, that it actually happened, that God works that way in my life. And I think that's what memory is about. It's not so much that we try to repeat the past. It's that we remember and value what has happened to us. And if we're able to really look at what happens in our life, we can say, in every age, O oh Lord, you have been our refuge. That those moments of insight, we remember not because we wish we could go back to the past, though sometimes maybe we do, but we remember them to believe that it's possible, that insight like that happens, that change can happen, that our vision can shift into place. And that's God's steadfast love, that God doesn't give up on us, no matter what happens, no matter how long it's been since some kind of spiritual insight, God's waiting around the corner to offer us grace and peace. And if we're able to look through the eyes of the examine to allow God to point our direction, we're able to gather the fragments of our day and witness a miracle. And we can see God's steadfast love for us. Thanks. Thank you both for your uh, your opening remarks. And uh, at this time, we'd like to encourage anyone to enter any questions in the chat feature. Uh, this is really all about a dialogue tonight and a great day. And uh, you know, two of you making yourselves available to our community and any of our uh, our listeners and experiences. Uh, we do have questions that we prepare, uh, so we can certainly lead off with that. And the first one, uh, a lot of this is about, uh, you know, it is a tough time, right, tough for, for everybody uh, in our world. And, and uh, you know, finding out all things is especially tough for times like these. So uh, I want to talk a lot, a lot about that and focus on your work in 2020, right? And let me first start off by asking how your ministry has changed over the last you know, eight months or so. Um, yeah, Dave, I think that you might be having some audio problems, but luckily he read the question to us ahead of time. So we know that he is asking us, uh, you know, how has our ministry changed in, in this time? 
Um, and so uh, I'll go ahead and share just that. Um, so I graduated in May and um, was then looking over the summer trying to find um, my call to a church. And um, so I was searching for a call in the midst of the pandemic, which was definitely a challenge, a challenge to do ministry in, that, in this time. Um, and then now have just started um, in mid-August. So started my first call and first um first church that I'm working in. And so, you know, my ministry is is challenging because of the pandemic, but also, you know, I, I don't have much to compare it to. So um it's really emphasized on relationship building. And so relationship building does look different in this time because, you know, normally, you know, as a minister, you're, you're relationship building by folks who come to church on Sunday morning and seeing all those faces in the pews and getting to know people in that way. Um, so, you know, that's not exactly how, how ministry is in this time, but um, still reaching out to people. And one, one kind of unique ministry that I did because of the, you know, world that we're in right now was I um, sent postcards to all of the kids in the church that I serve as a way to introduce myself to them. Um, um, and so that's been really fun because, you know, for each of the kids, as I was kind of writing out a postcard to them, it was an opportunity for me to pray for them and to, to just, you know, ask that I, you know, can get to know them and that God can guide them and, you know, the church. And then it's been really fun to get some of the kids have sent me postcards back to the church and they'll say, you know, Pastor Laura, you know, asking me questions and things like that. Um, so it's been great to to build relationships with the kids um, and then also to build relationships with you know, the adults are very much on Zoom and having meetings and on Zoom and things like that. Um, but I mean, and then the, the other thing I would just say about ministry is really, really one thing that I, um, from folks that I talked with over the summer was um, from other clergy, they said, you're used to, as a minister, you have you have people in your church that you worry about, you know, someone who's going through a divorce or someone who's, you know, just lost their parent. Um, you know, we're used to having people that we worry about and that we care about. But in this pandemic, we're, we're worried about everyone. Everyone, you know, is at more of a risk right now. Um, and so, so that can just be a challenge as well as just to to try and weigh the safety risks and be trying to be as safe as possible and also, you know, wanting to share God's love with people and connect as, as best we can. So. All right. How's my audio now? Can you hear me a little bit better? It's much better. Thanks. Much better. All right. Well, the question was, as you know, how has your ministry changed over the last eight months? And what I was saying was, you know, it's, it's especially hard to find God in years like 2020. So that's what some of these questions will be about. And that was the first question. So I, I pose that to you, Father Pinchak. How has your ministry changed over the last eight months? Well, um, it's changed more for uh, that I've changed jobs than, than just because of the, uh, the COVID. Um, I was in Italy, in Rome, when, you know, COVID really started to, trying to figure out what exactly this thing was. So I was fortunate in that I was one of the, the two younger Jesuits in the house of I, so I lived in a house of uh, 27 Jesuits from 17 different countries, um, a mix of uh, students and professors. Uh, all were, were, were Jesuit priests in the house. Um, and I was one of the two younger guys who was able to go out across the street to the pharmacy and across the street to the grocery store occasionally to, to buy food um, and get medicine because the rest of the Jesuits stayed in the house for six weeks. And Rome absolutely shut down. It was a completely different city. Italy really, really closed down. So... On the one hand, I was really grateful because it allowed me time to work on my thesis and I had access to the library. Um, and so what I found though was it was a, it was an opportunity to, to move a bit more in a monastic direction to sort of find some order into my life and, uh, and really, you know, move away from having, you know, a lot of guests and visitors and distractions from what I was really there to do, which was my main mission was to be a student. So um, it was a, in some ways, COVID was a, was an opportunity for me to reflect on what does Jesuit community mean for me? We had to be much more intentional. We had to be nicer to each other because we knew we wouldn't leave anytime soon. Um, and so I imagine it's the same thing as a lot of families. You're trying to find healthy ways to, to feel closer to each other, uh, to give each other the benefit of the doubt, to take the best possible interpretation on what somebody might say. 
Um, so I was really grateful for that. Um, in the last few weeks and months, it's been prepping to teach for at St. Ignatius High School. Before I'd even finished my, my final exams, I was on, you know, six hour, uh, video chats over, uh, setting up, you know, um, what's the word teaching where we were like learning how to teach online. Cause we were worried we were going to move totally online and they wanted everyone to do teacher in services and have these various opportunities. So it was really being thrown into a lot of, uh, a lot of changes and a lot of kind of stress and pressure to sort of figure out what, what was going on. As the, on the other hand, uh, being here new in the school, it feels like a lot of people feel very much like new teachers. I had taught before I taught English, but so now I'm teaching some, some new material and theology. Um, but it's really an opportunity to, to be able to be present to some of these long teachers, long-term teachers who have been here a long time and, and just sort of say, we're all trying to figure some of this out, out in a new way. Um, I'll say just one last little comment. Uh, I was talking to a Jesuit about the food options at St. Ignatius and about whether or not the cafeteria should just allow students to sort of eat, you know, food that I think is less than ideal. It's hard to find a vegetable in our cafeteria sometime. And I was just sort of talking about that. And he was sort of saying, well, you know, these kids, they have so much going on. How can we expect them to, to put all this extra pressure? And we, we want them to eat something. Otherwise, they won't eat anything. They're only here half the day, so they could go somewhere else. The debate was, was really about less about food and more about an idea of what happens when you're in a challenging situation. And St. Ignatius says, when you're in desolation, it's best to maintain as much structure as you can, to try to stay committed to whatever prayer commitment you have to not fall off of that. And so I was trying to make the point where I'm like, well, all the more reason to just have at least the food be in place for our students, you know? And I think there's a, there's a principle now is as things are ramping up, we're trying to do a lot of stuff in our lives. COVID is sort of appears to be going on for, for several more weeks and months, you know, all of the outside pressure that you're talking about. I think, I think I stand by my, my commitment to vegetables to say it's all the more reason to stay committed to the things that we know work for us and that are healthy for us and good for us, rather than just sort of saying, well, it's COVID, I'll give myself a lot of freedom to, to let loose and let go of things. So we do have a question that, that came in from, from Ryan Brown. Uh, who asks, you know, do you find it easier or harder to work on your relationship with God during a time like this? And maybe what, what Ryan's getting at is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of at home. We're, we're not doing the things. We're not, um, maybe don't have all the distractions that we typically have. Um, so in, in a, uh, on the flip side, um, maybe we have an opportunity or a path to, to find that that direct relationship with God a little bit easier. Um, so how would you both answer that question? Easier or harder to develop and foster that relationship with God right now? Father Cyril, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first this time. Um, when it comes to easier or harder to develop your relationship with God, I've, I've found that it sometimes it's sometimes when everything's going really well that it's it can be the most challenging for me to to strengthen my relationship with God. Um, I certainly feel like COVID has has made me more aware than ever of my powerless and powerlessness in a lot of situations, um, and so that can be really helpful. I think in terms of having a routine, and that's also very important in prayer, um, is that that it has been a real challenge to settle into a routine and a new job, a lot of early mornings and late nights working in a high school, uh, trying to help coach cross country, you know, be involved and in, in develop new curriculum, curricula and so forth. So on the one hand, I think that the, my prayer routine has been challenged for sure. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the prayer itself, as it happens, there's, there's more than ever things to, things to bring to God and to recognize my, my total dependency on God. So a lot of times my question when, when I talk to people about this in spiritual direction is, is to ask them, you know, well, what are your expectations for prayer? What do you want to get out of prayer? What, what does good prayer look like for you? And when I was working, um, at Loyola Chicago with, with some runners in a, in a prayer group, I kept trying to push them away from saying like, oh, there's good prayer and bad prayer to say, 
you know, when you hang out with your friends, are you just saying, you know, like, oh, that wasn't good hangout time with my friends. We didn't have a heavy, deep and real conversation. Or are you just spending some time with friends? And I think that's, that's the important thing is in, in COVID to take those moments, however long or short they may be, to spend some time and as Ignatius counsels, talk to God as, as you would talk to a friend. Laura? Yeah. Um, I think kind of like Father Cheryl said of like the routines, they can be, they can be hard to craft in this time, but also that, you know, I found myself going through waves of like from March until now of sometimes where I felt really close to God, um, but then other times where I didn't. And I just, you know, I definitely felt like I had to have grace for myself just to, to see like, it's okay. We're going through a really challenging challenging time and need to feel, you know, like every day is a great day. It's, it, and that's not just having a bad day is not a reflection on my relationship with God. It's okay to feel, to feel distant from God um, and to feel overwhelmed. Those feelings are okay. And, and God can, you know, hold those feelings and still, still be there, even if I don't feel, feel very close to God. Um, and so, you know, in the midst of all of this too. So I spent um, March until July, I went and stayed with my family. My parents live in Northeast Ohio. Um, and I think they're on the Zoom call. So hi, mom and dad. Um, and hi, so I, <laughs> I stayed with them. Um, and so that was really great to have the, to have the family time and, and seeing God in family is certainly, certainly a good thing. Um, and but then when I came here to Connecticut to start this job, now I'm living alone again, which is something I had done. But, um, you know, COVID times living alone is very different um, in this time. And so I just, you know, sat down and I prayed and I realized that I did feel like God was calling me to a little bit more intentional prayer time. Um, and so that was, you know, just getting out some of my prayer books and resources that I had and and really trying to make sure that because of just, you know, my life situation right now I wanted to be more intentional with that so um yeah it's it, you know it's it's both and good and bad and it's not all good and it's not all bad so you mentioned books and uh Linda commented to everyone about a book she uh she recommends and that was actually one of our questions uh for each of you uh are there any passages or readings that you feel are relevant during uh this time and and um something that might benefit um our, our, our viewers here tonight uh, that you can recommend to them. Go ahead, Laura. Um, well, this is one of those questions I wish I would have had a little bit more in advance, but um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not so well versed to be able to give you a scripture and, uh, and quote a book, but um, I've definitely been finding a lot of refuge in the Psalms at this time, um, you know, and some of, I like like I was saying of the good and the bad, the, the Psalms can be a really good thing because some of the Psalms are full of despair and full of woe and, you know, saying, why, God, why are you doing these bad things and why do I feel so distant from you? So you can find that in the Psalms, um, but then you can also find such joy and, you know, really a real excitement and just pleasure and um, celebration. So, you know, if you're if you're looking for that and, you know, for assurance or just just, you know, to celebrate with God that you can find that in the Psalms too. So I'm sorry, I can't give a specific one, but just, you know, flipping, flipping around and you can find lots of good things there. Father? Yeah, I would, uh, I would say that in these times, absolutely, the book of Psalms can, can be just a wonderful thing. Um, there's a lot of different apps and, and other kinds of things out there. One that I always recommend is Sacred Space um, through the, uh, Irish Jesuits, and it's really just a, a, a wonderful uh, program that you can you can listen to. Um, and one of the things that I that I think is also really helpful is to be able to spend a little time journaling and reflecting, um, and looking back on things what you what you've seen or, or read and uh, what's happened in your life. You can reread that years later and, and really be able to see a bit of that that steadfast love of God in your life. So those are two things that I would recommend. Um, like I just said, that that poem, "The Filling Station" by Elizabeth Bishop, is also a, is also a great little one just to just to sort of take a peek at. Um, and 
you know, there's plenty of, of, of great poets out there. Um, Mary Carr is a wonderful Catholic poet, K-A-R-R, Mary Carr. She's a bit um, edgy, maybe, for some folks, but it's John Carroll Crowd. I think they can take it. Um, and she is Catholic, you know, and, and she's very brutally honest in her prayer with God, and she puts that into poetry, which is really wonderful. Um, a lot of folks like uh, Mary Oliver as well. Um, she has some wonderful poems about finding God in nature. Um, and if you're up for it, you really can't beat um, some of the, the the church fathers, church mothers. Uh, I I'm really I think a lot of people can can do better than they think. Reading some Augustine, reading Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, there's really just some wonderful wonderful stuff out there. And uh, don't sell yourself sell yourself short. There's a lot of resources on the internet. You can read some pretty challenging theology. Um, read some von Balthasar if you want. Uh, Try it. You can do it. Read Vatican too. Just read through the catechism. It's wonderful stuff. It really is. In your spare time. Yeah. yeah. No, um, thank you both. The other thing, the other thing I would share too is if, if folks are interested in that examine prayer, like Father Cyril mentioned, there's actually an app for that too. There's, you know, an app for everything these days, but, um, it's called re, reimagining the examine and it walks you through the examine prayer. And then it also has different types of examine prayers too. So if you, you know, if the standard doesn't really fit for you, there's different, you know, modifications. So that's, that's an app that I would recommend. Great. Yeah. Thank you for those responses. And uh, Laura, sorry for not giving you a heads up on that question. It would have been way harder <laughs> if my microphone went out again. So at least you heard the question this time. Um, there's also some, some recommendations from our audience. Uh, so check the chat feature. Uh, Linda, Mary have both uh, put forth a couple of titles that they felt would be helpful to, to all of you. Um, a question that just kind of hit me, and it deals with, you know, all the turmoil going on, not just COVID related, but everything going on in the world. Um, does it get the two of you down? You know, if, <laughs> you know, you have this amazing relationship with your faith and with your God, and we're looking to you for, for guidance. Um, can you talk through just your personal struggles with, um, you know, how world events impact you. You guys okay? I was muted there. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy, happy to say a bit about that. Um, one of the things that, that I learned uh, in Chicago when I was studying philosophy and, and English is uh, I ended up seeing a, a psychologist who had seen Jesuits. Jesuits had been seeing this guy for free in his basement for like 25 years. And he lived in this uh, old original farmhouse in Chicago. It was just a wonderful guy because you didn't have to explain to him like what chastity was or what a superior was or any of these kinds of things. And one of the things that, that he told me, and it just really changed my life, is he said that that as Catholics, we believe that – God cares a lot about how we feel as in if it's if that God cares about how we feel and what's important to us is important to God and to be able to share that with God to be angry and upset and hopeful and joyful and whatever it might be to be able to bring a lot of those sort of taboo areas in our life of being angry or sexually aroused or whatever it might be to begin to bring those honestly to God in prayer can really transform your life in your prayer in your relationship with God. And if you think about a friend that you can be totally honest with, just how, how deep that relationship goes, I think that's, that's, uh, it's just transformative to, to people's relationship with God is they can start bringing anything and everything to God in prayer. And, and to recognize that, that we have a God who, who became human, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, who wept, at Jerusalem, who said, oh, if only you realized that salvation was in your midst. And I think that sometimes we need to be there and to, to struggle and to weep along with Jesus when we see people who just can't see the kingdom of God here, people who, who are doing everything but moving towards living in freedom and, and, and truth and living in relationship with God. And, and when challenges enter into our life and to be able to move into a, a deeper relationship with God through those um, has been really transformative to my life. And when I look at these challenging situations, I say, 
this is hard. This is difficult. There is great division in this world. And I think when I am able to be honest with myself and be honest with God in prayer, I, I can, you know, have some experiences uh, of, of God's compassion and God's longing for justice in the world as well. Thank you. Laura? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were asking that question of just, you know, how to how to get through challenging times um, is one thing that I've been, you know, trying to to take more seriously in in facing difficult times is God's commandment to rest and the importance of the Sabbath, um, you know, in in this digital world that we're in, it it can be really hard to disconnect and hard to you know unplug from our devices. Hard to take time away when you're you know if you're working at home and your your home is your work and your work is your home. All of that can be really difficult. And so, um, just just really being intentional with unplugging with taking time outside, um, you know, and even if you can't take a full day for Sabbath to take a half day um, or to just take a day where you, you know, are doing other things rather than constantly responding to emails or checking social media and things like that. Um, I, you know, and I've also taken a lot of comfort in the the Bible passage in the Gospels where Jesus was out on the boat with the disciples and he's sleeping in the midst of the storm and they wake him up because they're scared of the storm. And just thinking about, you know, if we're in this, if we're in a storm right now and that Jesus thought it was okay to take a nap. So it's okay for us to take naps too. And it's okay to rest when you need rest and rest is just so important. Um, so that's, that's what I've been really affirming for, for myself and for my friends. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jim asks a question. Um, now that we're not gathering in large groups, um, you know, how can we find ways to connect with one another in the context of worship and spirituality? Well, I'd, I'd like to just second, uh, you know, that, that idea of, of finding a Sabbath. Um, that's been a recent change in my life in the, in the last uh, calendar year, almost a full year, and it's really made a big difference. So I'd, I'd like to, to just say, yes, big thumbs up to that. Um, when it comes to, to connecting, I think, as in all things in life, we have to be intentional about it, um, and we have to be creative. And sometimes it means letting go of like our idea of what perfect might be or the old ways of doing things, and allow allow ourselves to to move towards something that's imperfect and move towards something that's different or new and to be surprised to be surprised by it so maybe it's going back to even some old fashioned things you know writing a letter by hand um getting on the phone calling some people you know it it also helps us to recognize the ways in which we've we've developed new ways of uh, of relating with technology and sometimes, you know, oh, well, we won't plan it. We'll just call them when we arrive. And before like, no, you'd say, well, we'll come over Saturday, three o'clock, set up an appointment, you know, and, and to, to make some, some plans. And it's challenging, um, because it requires us to, to think in a different way and to move out of some habits, but for relationships that are really important to us, it's, we have to, to negotiate and we have to make that, make that effort. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that has changed from, you know, the way that we worshiped maybe in January or February of this year, but there's also a lot that is still similar. You know, there were many churches who were live streaming their services before this time. And for various reasons, you know, that was maybe the safest or best way for people, you know, even before, you know, these times to, to join in service. So, you know, there's, there's different options when it comes to, to worshiping God on Sunday. If, you know, if that's live streaming, if it's zoom, you know, it's, it's, churches are doing so many different things. Um, so to find, to, defi to find your way of gathering with people and, you know, if, and maybe that's, you know, a prayer circle that meets outside safely or, um, you know, gathering with people over zoom, if that's, you know, if that's, in, in a way for you to connect with God. So I think I would just encourage folks to, to try different things. And, and, you know, if you can't do what you used to do, um, you know, like Father Cheryl said, like, don't, 
we can't get lost in that comparison of, and you know, that it might feel different and it might feel uncomfortable at first, but just to try things and that God can surprise us and um, show up in ways that we didn't expect. I'll, I'll add one thing because I, I think I misinterpreted the question. I looked in the, in the chat and I see that it really is also about worship um, as well. I would, I would say that, um, it's a complicated issue. We see a lot of things are, are stirring up in us. And, and I've had some conversations, particularly about people, with people at, at parishes I visited about their challenges with understanding mask laws and other kinds of things like that. And what I found in these conversations is that people's political views and the way that this whole topic around COVID and so forth has become a, a political issue, uh, besides just a health issue, is that it's putting people in a, in a difficult situation to say, well, what do I do with this tension in my life between my politics and between my relationship with God? People who are very sincere in their relationship with God and very sincere in their political views find this to be a, a very challenging time in some ways. And so I would say that it, it's the fact that there are these questions, the fact that there is this tension shows us that, that there's something in our life that, that we need God's guidance and wholeness because wherever the holy spirit comes there's always going to be a sense of, of integration and wholeness around this and i just hear a lot of division inside people's hearts around this and so i would say i don't have an answer about how you're supposed to negotiate what your health situation is or what your family or friends or or what you do with fear and anxiety but I think the only person who's going to be able to give you some clarity around those questions is going to be God. So that's, that's what I would say. Uh, we're, we're winding down here. Um, so I encourage anyone, uh, kind of a last call for questions, please enter those in the chat feature. Um, as a father of three young, young children, um, I sometimes think about how this is, you know, the long-term effects of what's going on um, with regard to their spiritual development, um, you know, experiencing sacraments and things of that nature, but doing so in a much different way. Can you speak about your experience with um, the youth um, um, uh, of the people that, that you serve and, um, you know, how, you know, any tips for parents or, or uh, anything that you're seeing that, that either is a concern or, or something that, that, you know, will, give us a sense of, of, uh, peace. Would you like to go, Laura? Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty new to the youth ministry and, um, that sense, but I think one of the things that I've read a lot about over the summer was just the, the reassurance for parents that, you know, if you, if you're worried about this, that shows that you, you know, you're, you're, probably trying to do the right thing and that kids learn so much by modeling. And so if you are, you know, faithful in, you know, watching services or taking your family to services, um, that that's, that's really the best foundation for religious education for, for young children. Um, and that there's just so much that we can do at home that, um, that kids can learn so much at home about faith formation. And, you know, if that's, you know, family prayers, if you, you know, say prayer, say a prayer before the meal, um, if you, you know, do prayers of gratitude as a family, like asking kids, you know, what was your high and low and God moment? Um, those ways of checking in and just, just letting kids know that they're loved, they're loved by you and in their family um, and that they're loved by God. That's, you know, really the, the best foundation that you can give, give them. It's beautiful. I, I had the opportunity to, well, yes. So I make my students, my freshmen in particular, they come right into class and there's always a question for them to start journaling on. And uh, also to get them to use their Bible, they have to look up a, a Bible passage. But one of the questions that I just asked, because we were talking about St. Ignatius and his experience at the Cardinal River, where he had this sort of mystical experience of divine light that changed his life. And he said, it was the most profound experience of his life that all of the other graces put together would not have equaled that one moment in prayer by a river in Cardinal, the Cardinal River outside of Manresa in Spain. And so I asked my students, I said, what's the most profound spiritual experience you've had? Or if you haven't had one, can you talk about some time you've been 
blown away by nature and awe of some kind of person or situation. And I was, I was so surprised and I shouldn't be, but I am. I was surprised. I feel ashamed. I was surprised that a number of these students, ninth graders said my confirmation. It just happened a couple of months ago, a week ago. It was this strange situation where they parishes are trying to figure out kids are getting confirmed in batches of five and 10 and two and three or individually. And for these students, it's the most profound spiritual experience of their life. And so I think as parents and as adults, we can be worried like, oh, it's not like how we remembered it, or it's not, you know, it's not this graduations or other kinds of things are all changing. And for these students, they don't, they don't, youngsters, they, they don't know any different reality in some ways. Maybe they do a bit, but grace is still grace and it's going to work. And it's bigger than our desires of what we want it to look like and how it can work and what we think can happen. And, and if we just trust that God's going to be there nurturing and developing and, and we give a little effort and God's going to respond with a, a measure that's overflowing and pouring out into our lap. Grace is there for especially the youngest ones. Thank you. That actually makes me feel a lot better. Thank you both for, for those answers. Um, I, I think we'll bring this to a close, but I do want to recognize a comment Linda makes in the chat box. Um, it really kind of strikes a chord with me. Um, and she, um, she mentions that she's, she's missing her uh, involvement with the choir. And, you know, there are no choirs right now. Even though we are able to gather in church to, to worship, there are no, uh, uh, you don't see choirs gathering and, and, and singing, uh, as they typically do. Uh, my mother feels the same way. I talk to her, um, you know, every week, almost every day. And, uh, that's the thing she's missing most as well. Linda is, is taking part in choir. It's a big part of her life. And so, um, so we feel for you and hopefully we'll all be back soon, um, in 2021 and able to do the things that we, we love. Um, I want to thank you all uh, for taking part in this discussion tonight, especially Father Pinchak and Associate Pastor Kisthart. And as a reminder, uh, this and all of our virtual programming is free. Visit jcu.edu uh, slash alumni or follow us on social media at JCU alumni for all of our upcoming events and more details. We have plenty more programs like this throughout the fall already on the calendar uh, so we hope you find something that, that is of interest to you and that you join us again. Uh, Laura, Cyril, any, any final comments before we, uh, we wrap up? No, just thank you. It was, it was really great to, you know, get to know you, Father Cyril, and to share, share an reflection together. Yes, thank you, Pastor Laura. It was wonderful to, uh, to hear your insights as well. And thank you, Dave, and the folks, uh, at John Carroll and, and the alumni relations, uh, really just, I'm so grateful for the experience that I had at John Carroll. It formed me and, and gave me the opportunity to be a Jesuit, and I couldn't imagine being happier. And so I know that that started with my time at John Carroll. So I'm really, really grateful to the way John Carroll has, uh, has formed me, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to say that publicly and, and to offer some of the grace that I've received and, and the gifts that I've received uh, back to the John Carroll community. Great. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Associate Pastor Kistart. Uh, if anyone wanted to ask a question, weren't able to get it in, you can email us at alumni at jcu.edu. We'll be happy to pass that on to either of our two presenters tonight. I'm sure we can connect you uh, directly uh, following the webinar. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. God bless. And onward on, John Carroll.